Now, on Radio 4, we present Saturday Night Theatre. The Fall of the Sparrow by Nigel Balchin. Adapted for radio by Anthony Keary with Ian Thompson and Brian Hewlett. The Fall of the Sparrow. If I'd kept to my original plan, I should have missed the whole affair. But the weather was vile, the river in spate, so I abandoned the fishing, came back to London a week early. I heard a telephone bell as I came up in the lift and somehow knew that it was my telephone and that it was vital to answer it. I went to it, said Henry Payne speaking, and so was destined next day to attend the court of session for the hearing of Rex versus Pellew. Oh, sorry to be late, Bryce. It's the traffic. I began to think you weren't coming, Henry. The case has started. Well, what are the charges against Jason? Well, the dear boy doesn't appear to have murdered anybody. But apart from that, he seems to have tried his hand at the fair range of things. Dud checks, false pretenses, stealing while a bailey, stealing a car. Oh. It's about £3,000 involved altogether. Every cent of the money's gone, of course. What do you think will happen? Well, there's an outside chance that he might be bound over, but I should say it's a hundred to one against. You can't put Jason forward as a person who's never had a chance. Not if you know some of the people I've defended in my time who really hadn't. He's had plenty of chances, and he's mucked them up every time. And no one else is the least to blame? Well, my dear man, we all have some responsibility for ourselves. You've known Jason for 20-odd uh, well, years. Do you tell me that he's just a crook who deserves no sympathy? I wasn't saying anything of the sort. I was only warning you of what the court may feel. Uh, you better go in and see him. And asked him his name. I then asked him to accompany me to the station. Uh, when arrested, the accused was wearing a major's uniform with the ribbon of the military cross and other decorations. He was wearing the ribbon of the military cross? Uh, yes, my lad. I should say that I'm instructed that the accused was a major in the late war and was awarded this decoration. And the other ribbons? Were they ones to which he was entitled? Uh, no, my lad. They appear to have been decorations awarded at various points in the war to members of the Italian forces by the German and American armies. Of course, the man's as mad as a hatter. Maybe, but not, I'm afraid, in the legal sense. He's been hopelessly unstable for years. You know it, I know it. People who do yes. these things usually are. Thank you, Milad. His counsel Milad. is about to open. I'm sure your lordship will agree with me uh, that this is a tragic case. Here is a man of previously unblemished character and an excellent war record uh, who, through folly, and worse than folly, uh, finds himself in the dock on these charges. I would only add, my lord, that my client now realizes that the course of conduct he embarked upon was both foolish and criminal, and he sincerely regrets his conduct and apologizes to those who had suffered as a result of it. Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Jason Pellew, on your own admission, you are guilty of a long series of offenses. Not only are these offenses serious crimes, but many of them have about them an element of meanness and ingratitude which makes them particularly distasteful. Your counsel has said that it is a tragic thing to see a man of your type and record in such a position. With that, I agree. You were born the son of a distinguished soldier. You were given a first-class education. You served your country gallantly during the war and had the honor to hold His Majesty's commission. I find it difficult to understand the reasons behind your actions. You would seem to have been singularly fortunate in your upbringing. Mommy, where are we going to see? To the abode of bliss. Oh, what's the abode of bliss? Oh, nothing, darling. We're going to tea with the general, that's all. What general? Uh, General Pellew, darling. He's got a little boy just a bit younger than you. His name's Jason. <laughs> His name's a sort of mixture of John and James, isn't it? <laughs> or Johnson and James. <laughs> Here we are. If I park over there, we can drive straight out. Philip, be careful. You're awfully close to that bush. Hey! Uh, steady there. Be careful, man. I beg your pardon. Ah, that's all right. 
But these things cost money. Don't want all the twigs broken off. <laughs> I'll pay. <laughs> afternoon, Mom. Good afternoon, General. Oh, boy. Well, come on in. No good standing around here. Mary! They've come! Mary! What the hell are you doing? Your guests have come. Oh, manners. Oh, I, I'm so sorry. Keeping people standing about. I'm so pleased you could come, Kitty. Hello, Mary. How do you do, Mr. Payne? How do you do? And this is little Harry. How would you do? Well, come on, Mary. Don't just stand around here. Bring your guests into the drawing room. Oh, yes. This way. Where's Jason? Out in the garden. What's he doing out there? He ought to be on parade with people here. Probably covered in mud and muck. But, George, it doesn't matter. The child must play. He can play when it's his playtime. If there are people here, he ought to be on parade. Somebody's got to show some elementary manners if you can't. How old is Jason? Seven. Ah, you wouldn't think it. Still wets his bed like a baby. Can't read properly. Of course, it's the way he's been coddled. I'd be obliged if you would carry out my wishes, Mary, and go and get your son. Oh, it's all right, George. Here he is. Here's Jason. Say good afternoon, darling. Hello, Jason. I'm Mrs. Payne, and this is Mr. Payne and Henry. Good afternoon. Well, go on. Shake hands with people, can't you? No, no, no. Better not. Hands are probably filthy anyhow. Go and wash them. Them, I wouldn't do as I say, Jason. <clears throat> what a lovely looking boy. That light yellow hair is... It's a good name for him, Jason. Carries the golden fleece around with him. <laughs> Damn silly name for a boy, if you ask me. But there it is. Mary wanted it. Well, is there ever going to be any tea? No more for me, thank you. That really was an excellent tea, Mrs. Pellew. Uh, and I expect the boys could eat a little more. Now, Harry, jelly with bananas on top or apricot flan? I expect he's finding it difficult to choose, aren't you, Henry? They're both favourites of his. Could I have some jelly, please? Of course. Jason? Do you think that I can... Whisper, Jason! Told you about it before. Speak up. Say what you've got to say, for God's sake. Oh, no, darling. You can't have both together. Why can't he if he wants it? He can quite well have jelly first and flan after. Who pays for the food in this house? And who makes it? Will you do as I tell you? <laughs> you want some jelly? Do you, man? Oh, George, that's far too uh, much. And some flan. Hmm? Mm. There. Well, that is... The, the boy can't eat all that. And you too. But I don't think Henry wants it, thank you. Jason, you're not eating. Well, what do you want now, old man? Hmm? Some, 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 some cream. <laughs> Is that it? Come along, darling. We must go. Oh, Jason, darling, don't cry. Don't cry. Poor little thing. Will you be all right, Mary? Would you like us to stay with you? Shall I go to the general? No, no, leave him. I'm all right, really, thank you. Don't cry, Jason. Mummy's here. Don't cry. I never went to the Pellew's house again. But Mrs. Pellew and Jason sometimes used to come to tea, and Jason improved on acquaintance. I think the main reason why I found him pleasant company was that he flattered me. 
It was pleasant to be with somebody with whom one was allowed to do all the boasting. The thing that puzzled me was the way he lied to his mother, even when it was not necessary. He never seemed to want her to know what he'd been doing, even when it had been entirely innocent. I thought it odd. Then I went away, first to prep school, then to Amblehurst. And I neither saw nor heard anything of Jason for nearly five years. Then, in the summer of 1929, a distraught Mrs. Pellew arrived on our doorstep. You know, he's attacked me before, Kitty, but never caused any physical harm. But this time, he threw a cup. It cut my forehead, and I had to call Dr. Schwartz. Oh. Well, he found out what had happened and told George that if he couldn't control himself, he was in danger of being certified. Oh, yeah. And that did it. George flew into a rage. I've never seen him so violent. He shouted that the doctor and I were having an affair, and he tried to shoot us. Oh. He fired at us as the doctor drove me away. Oh, uh, Philip, what's the news? Not good, I'm afraid. He's wounded a police sergeant who tried to rush him. N not too badly, it's only a flesh wound. Oh. He seems to think the Germans have invaded us, led by someone named Schwarz. Well, that's the name of my doctor. I see. And where's Jason? I don't know. That's, that's what I'm so worried about. He went out, you know, the way boys do before any of this happened. Oh, take me over there, Mr. Payne, please. I can't bear to wait here, not knowing. Of course. But Jason won't come to any harm. He'll never get near the house. Whoa there, Miss. Whoa! Just ease the rain gently, Master Jason. Thank you, Mr. Briggs, for letting me bring her back. Any time you want. Yeah, you just find out how much you... Oh, afternoon, General. Afternoon, Briggs. Oh, I see you've got your gun. Going after rooks? Yes, far too many of them in the trees here. They make such a damn noise. Uh, you've got a nice afternoon for it. It's been a nice summer all round. Yes, 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 yes. We've been very lucky with the weather, very lucky. Uh, yeah, we'd better have a pint, I think. Take the bottle, will you, Jason? There you are. Thank you, General. Yeah, best be on my way. I'm best. Bye, Master Jason. Afternoon, General. Good shooting. Thank you, Briggs. Now, Jason. Over here. With me, behind cover. <clears throat> right. They'll be moving in now he's gone. Who, Father? The Germans. Didn't you see them as you came up the drive? No, I didn't. Ah. Ah, keeping low, of course. Taking advantage of the cover, working their way up to the house. Keep back. One over by the trees. I'll ah, show him. It's a damn spy, Schwartz. There's all the ground. But we'll beat him just as we beat the hunt before. Mm. Must have an advance party, a lookout. Jason, you go down the drive, hide in the bushes and whistle when anybody approaches. If there are too many or it gets too hot for you, Fall back on the main defense. You understand? Yes, Father. Good. I'll give you covering fire. Huh? Now, off you go. But keep your eyes open, Jason. They're a crafty lot, these Germans. Remember the signal? He's going mad. My father. He's gone mad. His mother. No. Don't run. You'll shoot if you run. Don't panic. Keep walking. Round the bend. Out of sight. And... Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Mother! Mother! Jason! Jason! Over here! Mother! You're safe now, Jason. Quite safe now. They took the general off to an asylum. Mrs. Pellew was completely shattered by these events and she was in a nursing home for some months. So Jason went to his godmother, Lady Peasmore. And from there, about a month later, came to Amblehurst. I was then in the upper fifth. And Jason, with his mop of yellow hair, his pouting mouth and shy smile, was taken up by Bryce, who was head of the house. 
For a year, Jason was the king's favorite, indulged, pampered, protected. At the end of the year, Bryce left. But Jason, instead of singing small for a couple of terms, continued with the same casual, mocking attitude towards authority and the same process of slacking and wangling. Matters came to a head when he cut a football training run. The head of the house, Farthing, called a prefect's meeting. Well, does everybody agree that for you be given a house beating? Giles? I'll put my hand up for that. In fact, I'll put up both hands. Oh, ah. Right, we're all agreed then. No. What? Not me. Oh, Payne, you're a Payne. prefect too. We must stand together on this. You can do what you like. I shan't have any part in it. There are still four of you left, and he isn't a very big lad. But then he'll only get eight whacks. He should get ten. Yes. You and Ramage are the seniors. Give him an extra stroke each to make up the number. Good idea, Giles. All right, Payne. Send the little slacker in. Right, Jason. The prefects will see you now. Thank you, Payne. Aren't you staying? Come on in, Pellew. We haven't got all night. Pellew. You know why you're here. You've earned a house beating. You're cheeky, disrespectful, a slacker. You're caught cutting a games run. You don't seem to worry about the team or the house cap. You're not keen enough. Take that smile off your face. I didn't smile. You're a liar, you did. You lie about everything. Now, we're going to show you what the house thinks of lying, little slackers. Bend over that chair. Jackson, you first. Oh, that's the best you can do. That wouldn't hurt a fly. Ramage, your turn. All right. Well, that's better. Giles. <laughs> More like it. Now me. Get down. Two more yet. No. Two from each. That's the rule. Don't argue, you little tick. There are five prefects. You're two whack shot. But Payne's not here. Well, we'll take care of that now. Do as I tell you, you little fuck. Go to hell. I'll teach you. Hold him down. I'll come here, you little... Oh, you go. Don't help me, get you. Go. Now, get I'll go. teach you. I can't hold him, Farthing. <laughs> oh. Oh, my hand. Oh, Farthing, my Get after him. Look, why did you stop him? Oh, my hand. It's all right for you, Farthing. You brought that Look, cane you down. Look, if you would held him properly, there were three of you. Oh, my hand. I can see you didn't need my services after all. Don't be funny, Payne. This is serious. Yes, it's more serious than you imagine. I've just seen the headmaster. General Pellew, Jason's father, he's dead. Suddenly, a heart attack. He's sending the boy home. When Jason came back from the Easter holidays, the house felt that he'd owed him an apology. He had been beaten the day his father died. He must now be mildly indulged, and the house decided that the proper role for him was that of amiable eccentric. Of course, he accepted the part and began to live up to the reputation he had been given. It showed first in his football. He had been good, but orthodox. He now became moody, incalculable, with days of great brilliance and others of dullness. He painted the walls of his study in a brilliantly coloured abstract design. He acquired a passion for gardening and used to go and work for hours with Blake, the house gardener. A week before I left, I went out for a walk alone, taking a romantic farewell of the place. Hello, Payne. Oh, hello, Jason. Beautiful, isn't it? The evening sun and the fields. Yes. This is about the last time I'll see this. Nice for you. Oh, I don't know. In a way, of course, but I've enjoyed this term, haven't you? Oh, yes. Thank you for standing up for me over the beating business. It was good for me, of course, but you weren't to know it would be. You really think it was? Oh, very good for me. If I ever have children, I shall beat them like that all the time. Everybody's liked me so much better since, haven't you noticed? <laughs> yes, but... Well, that's what I mean. You'll find it better every term now. After all, you'll probably be in the sixth next term. 
I probably shan't be here. I may be going to South America as a tea planter. A man I know asked me to. I may be wrong, Jason, but I don't think they grow tea in South America. This man said they did. Why don't you come to Cambridge? If I was clever like you, I would. You know perfectly well you're cleverer than I am. Not that that's saying much. Oh, no, I'm not clever at all. But I like growing things. Have you seen that mallow I grew in the garden? The one with your initials on? Yes, it's a whacker. It's very easy, really. I only planted the seed and then stuck the plant on a heap. It was a fluke it came up so big. Well, I must be going. And thank you for being so decent about that beating business. Well, in case I don't have a chance to say it again before I go, goodbye, Jason, and uh, good luck. Goodbye, and the same to you. I usually say I enjoyed my time at Cambridge enormously. In the early 30s, some people could happily take three years over a very ordinary, ordinary degree. Yet for the scientists, of whom I was one, there was far too much work to be done in far too little time. I had, therefore, very little social life. And I can't remember how it was that early in my third year, I came to be at Simon Greaves party. Simon was the college aesthete. And I remember that on this occasion, he was wearing plus fours made of pale blue velvet. Oh, so pleased to come, Simon. What is that? Oh, a snake? Haven't you met the tempter, my dear? Superb, isn't he? If you just hold him, I'll go and get you a drink. No, 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 no! Don't unwind him, Simon. He looks so comfortable on your arm. I can easily get myself a drink. Oh, there's someone I haven't seen for years. Oh, you know Jason, do you? Very unmistakable, like a Botticelli. <laughs> so fetching, and such a relief from all those hearty games players, don't you think? I'll be back, Simon. I must have a word with him. Hello, Jason. Why, oh, hello, Henry. What are you doing here? I'm up now at St. Mark's. Oh? You might have called on me. What are you reading? Modern languages. After Amblehurst, I spent a year in Italy. If you speak Italian, and practically everybody else doing Italian doesn't, you don't really have much to do. In you go, darling. In oh, there. no, Simon. Don't put the tempter in the coal but box. Don't like it. I'll have him. Always well, darling. Oh, oh, now, where were we? Well, I'm not going to talk to you while you've got that damn thing. I can't bear snakes. Oh, well, all right. I'll find somewhere comfortable for him. Uh, do you know Jason Pellew? Hmm? Oh, oh, my name's late Lord Marx. You know our Jason? Yes, we were at school together. Oh, yes, at Amblehurst. Yes, I've heard something of that. What an attractive fellow he is. I'm devoted to him. He has a sort of childish wisdom and, and goodness. How long have you known him? Oh, only since he came up. We were got in conversation the first day of term. Since then, we've seen a lot of each other. As a third-year man, I've been trying to show him the ropes. Uh, I suppose you didn't know his father. Hmm? Uh, whose father? Jason's, the missionary. Surely his father was a retired general. Oh, his father was a missionary who lost his life somewhere in the South Seas. Well, it's a tragic story. Uh, Jason never says so in so many words, but... Um, well, reading between the lines, I gather he was actually murdered and, uh, and well, devoured. But Jason did tell you that he was a missionary? Yes, why? I didn't know that. Oh, no, I'm not surprised. I mean, Jason doesn't talk intimately with many people. And, look, as an old friend of his, or at least an old acquaintance, uh, you can be discreet. I hope so. You know, perhaps he's been in Italy. Yes, studying languages. Exactly, yes. studying languages. And, incidentally, preparing a report on fascism for the British government. He's rather young for that, isn't he? Exactly, there's the genius of the thing. I mean, who would suspect him, looking like that? Yeah, I think I ought to take him away soon. Well, not until I've had a chance to ask him in one evening. Ah, uh, no, no, well, we'll fix that. Uh, I don't know your name on college. 
Henry Payne, St. Luke's. Jason won't be able to give you long. He's doing a translation of Bembo, you know, the Italian Renaissance poet. It's a remarkable piece of work. And Jason's so inside it. Of course, he has the language quite perfectly. You speak Italian? No, not actually. Then how on earth do you know whether he has it perfectly or not? I told him. True to, as it happens. The real inglese italiano e diablo incarnato. That's me. How are your father and mother? They're very well, thanks. How's your mother? Jason's mother is dead. She died last year. We've a lot to pick up on, Jason. How about coming in one night for a chat? A Sunday after hall? I'm in college. Staircase B, old court. Thank you, Henry. I'd like to. Good night. Good night. Good night, Payne. I'm glad to have met you. Good night. Good night. Darling, who was that extreme person with little Jason Pelot? Heaven knows. His name's Laidlaw. Well, he's the most extreme person. <laughs> he's a naughty little boy, that Pelot, but so sweet, don't you think? Yes, I rather like him. Oh, Henry, don't be so po-faced. He's adorable. He says he knew you at school. Oh, how I envy you. Nothing as gorgeous as that ever happened to me at school. Hope I'm not too late, Henry. Ah, oh, hello. I'd rather given you up, Jason. But do come in. What have you done with your amanuensis? Laidlaw? I've given him the slip. He thinks I'm still in my room. But what is all this, Jason? Why do you always have him hanging around? I don't know. He likes it. And he's been very kind to me in his way. I dare say. But that's no reason for telling him your father was eaten by cannibals. Well, he would keep asking me about my people, and I felt I had to to do something nice for him. He has a very dull life, you know. They're very poor and live in Oldham, and Arthur's working his guts out so that he can get a good job and keep them all. And you thought the cannibal story would make it nicer for him? That's right. You see, he's a romantic, really. Is your mother dead, in fact? Oh, yes. She died last year. I'm sorry about that, Jason. Oh, I don't know. It's probably just as well. She hadn't had much fun for a long time. Where do you live now? Where I was before, with my godmother, Lady Peasmore. She's my trustee. Have you got any beer? Oh, I'm so sorry, Jason. I'm forgetting my duties as a host. Are you enjoying Cambridge? Very much, thank you. Except that it's a bit childish after Amblehurst. After Amblehurst? Yes. Everything mattered so much there, and you had to be careful. But here, everybody seems to do as they like. There's no discipline. Don't you like that? Not much. Ah, thanks. I don't think I'll stay here long. Hmm? I inherited a small amount of money from my mother, just enough to keep body and soul apart, but it's in trust. I can't touch the capital until my godmother dies. Then I shall buy a boat or a market garden and grow branded vegetables. You know, Pelou's super onions. <laughs> I think there'd be money in it. Is Simon Greaves a friend of yours? Oh, no, I've got a girl. Simon's furious about it. You must meet her in the vacation. Mm. What's her name? Leah. She's a Jewess. I think that's very important, don't you, with all these things that are happening in Germany? Are you Jewish? No. I mean, never at all, any of your ancestors? No, not any of them, as far as I know. I just wondered. Will you come and see us during the vacation? You can meet my godmother, have dinner with us in Cheney Walk, and then we can go on to see Leah. Quite a change from Cheney Walk, eh? It is a bit grim. It's all they can afford. They've got two rooms and she has her mother, but I want you to meet her. Jason. Oh, one minute. Hello. Come in. This is Henry Payne, Leah Garland. How do you do? Hello. You don't have to worry about Henry. I've known him since school. Before, really. Now, how are you getting on? We're making some slogans, Henry, on these sheets of cardboard, see? Uh, fascism means war. Down with Mosley. Now, I've got some stencils. The trouble is, the letters are all the same size. You really want several sizes. Now, war ought to be bigger. Hmm. I think it would be better if you had it more square and war underneath. 
Do you want them all the same? No. Four of these, four down with Mosley, and four stop Hitler now. Hmm. I'll do stop Hitler now. Now bigger, like war. That's it. I'll carry on while you go and talk to Henry. This is all very funny, isn't it? It is, rather. I thought you'd think so. People like you always do. No, 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 no. I, I don't think fascism is funny. But ordering four down with Mosley and four stop Hitler now is, at least to me. Of course it is. Damn funny. You can see it is, Leah. I'm afraid my sense of humour stopped working on this subject. You don't think fascism's funny, but equally, of course, you don't think it's serious. Yes, I think it's serious in Italy and uh, even more so in Germany, but I don't think it's serious here, or likely to be. It can't happen here. He ought to come down with us one Sunday, mm. to the East End. You'd know then whether there was anything to fight or not. You mean you go to fascist meetings? Yes. We go and we break up their meetings, or we try to. If there are enough of them, we may get broken up ourselves, but at least we don't let them talk their poison in peace. Can't the police do anything? The police? <laughs> he must certainly come with <laughs> us. You wouldn't like to kiss me, I suppose, Jason? You haven't kissed me this evening. Yes, I should. Uh, I must go. Don't let me disturb you. Hmm? Oh, don't go. There's some coffee coming. I really must. All right, as you like. Are you coming on Sunday? It's rather tough sometimes. Yes, I should like to. If Jason will let me know where to meet you. I bet this is the last thing you imagined yourself doing, Henry. What are you going to do, exactly? Make them lose their tempers and start a fight. Once it gets tough, just bolt. There won't be much today. This is only the second eleven. Look after yourself. And you can see them any night you like. Spending money like water. The ivy that is rotting the oak tree of this land. Fast and the good tree once, a healthy plant. But now this fungus is strangling its roots. But if you were rich, you can certainly have it. Ashes are meat. Bastards! You see where the danger lies? All around you! Hitler has the right idea. Germany for the Germans. We should copy him. Britain for the British! Bastards! Right, bastards! You bastards! You scum! Get the needle! There! There! The bastards! Here, come on, mate! I'm off! Bastards! Jason? Leo? Well, hey, come on, mate! Don't hang around! I'm sorry that was so dull. It's usually livelier than that. <laughs> well, did you enjoy it, Henry? It was very interesting, but... Well, go on. Well, a bit childish. Rather like shouting ya yeah and running away. Well, that's about all it is. But Jason likes it. Don't you, sunny boy? I like it better when they have the loudspeaker. Have you any beer? I'm thirsty. There's some bottles in the larder. Bring one each, will you? We must kiss and be friends, mustn't we, Henry? Yes, of course. Then kiss me. Mm. That's right. I didn't think you'd come, but I'm glad you did. God knows we need everybody we can get. I didn't do anything, you know. I didn't even shout. It doesn't matter. You'll have plenty of chance to do things later. We all shall. Pull on the left a bit, Henry. We've got the bridge. How's that? Fine. Hmm. I wanted to talk to you. Is there going to be a war, Henry? Mm. Leo thinks there will be soon. I wish one knew. You've heard from Leo? Oh, yes, I often do. Uh, this is confidential, because she doesn't want anybody to know, but Leah's joined the Communist Party. <laughs> I thought she was a communist anyhow. <laughs> yes, but now she's actually joined. Are you going to join? 
I don't know. They're so... so cliquey. They will keep talking about Russia, which never seems to me to have much to do with us. I mean, it's quite a different country. But if I've got to be on a side, of course, I'm on theirs rather than the fascists. I don't think I'll stay here. I'm tired of just messing around with people like Simon and going to parties and so on. <laughs> I can understand that. But don't give up before May week, will you? I don't think I shall come. I haven't got anybody to bring. What? How about Leah? Leah? Yes. Well, no. I mean, it wouldn't be her sort of thing, anyway. She wouldn't have a dress. She's awfully poor, you know. You could always get her one. What do you mean, buy her a dress? Mm. Yes, I suppose so. I hadn't thought of that. How much would it cost? About. You see? My rooms are only a staircase away from the dance floor. Oh, what a relief. <laughs> oh, do you mind if I take these darn shoes off? <laughs> oh, my feet ache. And I dance like mm. a cow anyway. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for my nice dress. I look terrible. Oh, don't be silly. You look very handsome. He told me it was your idea. But you see, he went and bought it by himself as a surprise. By sitting up all night for the last three, I've made it wearable. <laughs> but of course, I look awful in this colour. Uh, let, let me give you a drink. Oh, I, I don't think I will. I don't really like it. This is the first thing of this kind I've ever been to. I mean, champagne and tailcoats and so on. You enjoying it? It's very interesting. And rather sad, in a way. Yes, I, I suppose now you're a communist, you're against champagne and white ties, bloated capitalists and all that. So, he told you. That's one of the difficulties about Sonny Boy. He can't keep that pretty mouth shut. No, it's sad because, well, because it's out of date. Rather like what's-her-name's ball before Waterloo. You think there's going to be a war tomorrow morning? Not tomorrow morning, but before most of these nice silly children are much older at least i hope so you hope so if the fascists have got away with it in abyssinia it won't be long before they try it somewhere else and then somewhere else and so on <sighs> the sooner we make a stand the better before they've got it all set up look don't you think we'd better go and find jason he's rather tight he's quite happy and that's not a thing that happens to him often oh i can't understand you people you just, you just stick your heads in the sand and keep them there. Well, good God. I've worked my head off for months to get my finals, and, and, and then I come to this bloody ball hoping it'll be some fun, and Jason buys you a dress, and, and then you sit there and say we'll all be dead in a few months, and... Oh, poor Henry. Oh. What a darn shame. You're quite right, my dear. I'm so sorry. Kiss me and say I'm forgiven. No. no, don't push me away. Kiss me. Mm. Mm. Look, I think I ought to go and find my partner. Oh, damn your partner. Come here. No, no really, Leah. Anyhow, how about Jason? What about him? Well, after all, you're his girl. I think you're all mad. All quite mad. Hmm, dear Henry, let's go and find people. Let's go and find Jason. Then I must get ready for tomorrow. Hmm. Why? What's happening tomorrow? I thought you said it was the Battle of Waterloo. But it wasn't Waterloo. It was the Spanish Civil War that erupted during that long summer vacation. I remembered Leah's warning that Abyssinia was only another step on the march of fascism, but I did not allow it to disturb me unduly. My course was set. I had obtained a first and returned to Cambridge for another year. Oh, hello, Laidlaw. I haven't Look, seen I'm you. I'm sorry to intrude on you, Payne, but this is urgent. Jason's been talking very widely. 
Two days ago, he suddenly told me he's proposing to leave Cambridge at once and go to Spain to support the Spanish government in war. Oh, I wouldn't take that too seriously, Laidlaw. He's pulling your leg. I assure you he isn't. I've never seen him more serious in his life. But since you have some influence with him, would you reason with him? Yes, I'll speak to Jason if it'll put your mind at rest. But I assure you, you're having your leg pulled. Thank you. Oh, he asked me to give you this note. I'm sorry to have intruded on you. Dear Henry, there seems to be rather a big meeting of the jackboots going on in Spain. And I have decided to go and shout ya at them, and then of course run like hell. Anyhow, I've never been to Spain and would like to go. I'm sorry to go off like this without seeing you, but I was afraid you might not approve. And I don't want to be disapproved of any more at the moment. Tralala, -la, and thank you for having been so decent that time. Yours, Jason P. It must have been in December 1936 that Jason went off to Spain. And for the next 18 months, I neither saw nor heard from him. In March 1938, Hitler annexed Austria. And so it went on into September with the German pressure on Czechoslovakia reaching its climax. And was still going on when one day I was walking down Oxford Street and met Jason. We went into the park to talk. Leah gave me news of you, that you were in hospital and had been bombed quite a bit. I didn't desert the ship, you know. I came out to negotiate for more supplies and Franco has not closed the way to my HQ. I was ordered not to return, but to work with the refugees. What was it like for you? Both sides are a crazy lot. But I think Franco must win now. They're strong, those fascist bastards, damn strong. They've got all the stuff and they know what they want. The only reason we've kept them working as long as this in Spain is because the Spaniards know what they want too, but we don't, nor do the French. We're just being sane. And no sane man's got a chance with them. If there's a war, they'll knock us down like nine pins. Well, never mind, Jason. We're all in it together, for what that's worth. All in it together? Of course we're not. I don't see why you should be dragged in just because people like Leah and me don't like the jackboots. But I don't like them either. You really don't? Of course not. And I know they've got to be stopped, whatever it costs. Inexorably, we move towards Munich. The House of Commons wildly cheering Chamberlain with his umbrella and his delusions. A few days later, when the terms of the Munich Agreement were known, there were plenty of people who saw the wryness of the joke. Jason enlisted in a county regiment, and I found myself earmarked for a special army unit whenever war should break out. On the 1st of September 1939, Hitler invaded Poland. The next night, I went to see Jason off to his regiment from King's Cross. Would you mind? Thanks, sir. Half London seems to be joining their regiment. Excuse me. Sorry. Oh, oh sorry, sorry. Leah said she'd be... Oh! Me? Could you... Thank you. Said she'd be waiting at the barrier. We can never get... Oh, mind that. Over here! Where? Yep, there she is! Oh, Leah! Excuse me. Thank you. Oh, hello, Leah. Henry's come along to see me off, too. Hello. Oh, you do look smart, Leah. That uniform suits you. Thank you. Well, I think you've got your wall this time. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. <laughs> this way, we'd better try to find you a seat. Yes. Oh, excuse me. No. Worse than Oxford Circus in the rush hour. <laughs> yes, mine. Oh. I think you'll be lucky to find standing room, Jason, let alone a seat. Well, perhaps Leah could take me in her ambulance. It might be more comfortable. I'd think twice before committing yourself to our tender care. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's a place. <laughs> oh, but, yeah, here you are, Jason. Thanks. Well. Well, goodbye, darling. Look after yourself. Mm. Goodbye, Henry. Goodbye. Keep an eye on Leah if you get a chance. She's so darn reckless. Right. Cheerio. Bye, Jason. Bye. 
Goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye, Jason. Damn, I'm going to cry. No, I'm not. Let's get out of this mob, for God's sake. He's going to be killed, you know. Oh, come on. I've always known he would be. If it happened. I may, and you won't. But he will be. Oh, half a minute. We aren't even at war yet. No, I forgot. There's always Mr. Chamberlain. No, not even he can stop it now. You know, I didn't make Sonny Boy go to Spain. I know you think I did, but it's not so. And I didn't make him do this. I couldn't have, anyhow. I couldn't make him do things. He... You see, he doesn't love me at all, really. He won't let me get anywhere near him. He won't let anyone come very near him, you know. But why not, Henry? Why not? He's the loneliest person I know. And yet, he won't let me help. I wouldn't have asked for anything or been a nuisance. Honest, I wouldn't. He doesn't trust me, and he lies to me, and... I only partly understand myself, and... Oh, it's a very long story. Well, anyhow, I didn't see why I should come and weep on you about it. You've joined up too, I believe. Tell me all about it. And so we went to war. And disaster succeeded disaster. Norway, Dunkirk, the Blitz. Jason's godmother had gone into the country and the house in Cheney Walk became an unofficial transit camp for Jason's friends on leave and a few permanent residents, Leah amongst them. One night in October 1940, I think it was, we were all there together with Bryce, Jason's protector at Amblehurst. He and Jason had been in France from the start and had run into each other during the retreat to Dunkirk. It was a particularly heavy raid, so we all decided to walk with Leah to her headquarters. Something big's gone up over there, behind Waterloo. I can't think why they never seem to pop one on the war office. I suppose they're just letting well alone. What's that, Bryce? Sounded like a cat. There. I've got it, in the torch, over in the ruin. Oh, look at it, skin and bones, here. Oh, here. come on, you can't go messing about after that now. But we can't leave it here. Give me that torch, Bryce. Here, push, 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 push. Hell! Jason, there's one coming in low. Jason, will you stop shining that bloody torch and come on? Not to be put out. Look out, get down! Everybody all right? Leah? Henry? That was near enough. Jason! Coming! Oh, I don't think it was that near, but it was a big one. You little fool! You bloody little fool! Going off like that after a maimed cat, we might all have been killed. You silly little fool! Sorry, darling. No! Don't touch me! I don't want anything to do with you. You're not fit to be about. Where are you going? To drive an ambulance. At least that's a useful thing to do. Leah, wait. Let her go, Henry. But she's in no state well, to drive. Well, damn it all, she's my girl. Maybe she... you two. What I think is we all need a drink. By the way, what happened to the cat? I shot it. Just before the bomb fell. It had to be put out of its misery. Its back legs were paralyzed. You haven't got your revolver on it. No, but I had then. I took it off when I came in. Now I'll get those drinks. There's a bottle in the kitchen. Excuse me. Why on earth did Jason say he'd shot that cat? He can't possibly have done. He does that sort of thing at times. But why, Henry? I don't see the point. Usually it's when he thinks something would be pleasanter for all concerned, so he says it happened. Don't you remember he used to do the same sort of thing at school? He thinks it would be better if the cat had been shot, so he says he shot it. Does he really believe you shot it? I don't think so. I doubt if he even thinks you believe it. 
I just don't understand it. It was amazing to see as the war went on how the army accumulated experts. I became an expert in training parachutists and found myself in 1943 running a crash course training agents for dropping into occupied Europe. It was all top security and what happened to them afterwards was no concern of mine. But when I heard that Jason had been through the course, I obtained permission to see him off. At one end of a Nissen hut, three men were seated on a bench. Two of them looked exactly like everybody's idea of Italians, and the third was Jason. I had expected that his hair would be dyed or his skin darkened, but he sat there with his yellow mop of hair and his pink and white skin, wearing a British warm and a woolen scarf in our old school colours. Hello, Jason. How's everything? I've come to see you off. Oh, hello, Henry. Everything's fine. By tomorrow, I shall be in a civilised country with some sun while you poor bastards will still be here. <laughs> uh, uh, are, are they coming with you? Well, uh, not exactly with me. It's a sort of all stations to London Bridge affair. Mm. Anything you want done? No, thank you. Look, Jason, just one thing. What did you tell Leah, in case I see her? What's your cover story? I've gone to North Africa to help with airborne training. She'll get various letters from me there. Fine. As long as I know. Yes, Henry. Well, but I've got pins and needles in my right leg. When I get pins and needles, it means that ten minutes after, my right leg won't work. I can't even stand on it without falling down. I've had it before. You've had it before? Then you must tell somebody. It's no good going off on a thing like this with a gammy leg. No, that's not the point. It's only a question of getting into the ruddy plane. After that, it's all right. It, it, if it plays up, will you give me a bunk up when nobody's looking? Of course I will. Ready for you now, gentlemen. Anyhow, it'll be all right because we're going now. Can you manage to stand? Yes, I think I... Oh, what? what? Half a moment. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Henry. Nearly went for a perler then. Look, Jason, this is no good. Well, 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 collapse of small party. Give me your arm, Henry. Lead on, will you? Rather slowly. Waiting for you now, sir. Henry, I can make this work if I want to, but I have to tell it to make each step. You watch. No, let go my arm. See? I bet I could make it dance if only I could concentrate on it. It's concentration you need. The plane's over there, sir. Jason, let, let me know. No, see. Henry. Concentration's done the trick. It's all right now. Uh, Captain Pellew? Goodbye, Henry. Good luck, Jason. Thank you very much, Henry. Tomorrow I shall be in a civilized country with some civilized sun, and you poor bastards will still be here. You think he could keep that from me? Surely you know by now that the little man never kept his mouth shut in his life. He told me he was going, and he told me where. Shh, shh not in the restaurant, Leah. Oh, don't worry. Nobody can hear. It, it doesn't seem to have occurred to you that he loves me. As far as the poor bastard can love anybody, which isn't much. Well, he came to see me. And we had five hours together, just five hours. Between the hours of midnight and five in the morning. It was the first time for months. I don't suppose you've ever seen Jason when he was really frightened. Oh, I think I have. I wonder. Well, he makes quite a job of it. Trembling and crying and clinging to you. I've had it before and it's quite simple to deal with. Maybe any woman could do it for him, but... Well, he happened to have me at the time, so I coped. What did you do? Try to stop him going? I told him I loved him. Which was true. And that I couldn't live without him. Which wasn't. And he swore by God's truth he wouldn't go. Well, then I went to sleep. I suppose that was about three... I woke up before five and he'd gone. 
And that's the last I saw of him or ever shall. Leah, there were plenty of times when he could have got out of it. But he didn't because he thought he ought to go. <sighs> At least you didn't say I sent him. In a way, you did. The reason why he thought he ought to go was you. Go on, Henry. This is fascinating. It's true. That was the reason why he's done everything in this war and before it. It was your war. That was the only thing he was interested in, or ever has been. So it was for my sake that he took this on, and then swore he wouldn't, and then sneaked out of bed while I was asleep and left me. Yes. I never knew a man who wouldn't let you down. I never knew a man who wasn't a coward and a liar. I never knew one who didn't want to bully half the time and cry on your bosom the other half. And I never knew one who didn't end up by telling you he'd done it all for your sake. Thank you for telling me that. It ties up with all my previous experience. And it lets me out. I can now fight my own wars without having to worry about little liars and cowards, or big ones. What does that mean, apart from just being rude? You say it's my war. You always thought so and always told him so. If you'd had your way, you'd have sold Poland the way you sold Spain and the Czechs and the way you're selling Russia. My war. All right, I accept that. It's my war. And I'll fight it. Goodbye, Henry. And be careful you don't get your feet wet. In the early days of 1944, I was a major with a department of about a dozen experts. We trained people, we sent them into the blue, and we never saw them again. So that we never knew how our training worked out in the field, or whether we needed to alter our methods. After months of badgering, it was agreed to attach someone temporarily, between jobs, so to speak. Someone who was coming back in a couple of days' time. I went to meet him at our London headquarters. Henry, by God, it's good to see you. Welcome back, Jason. <laughs> How are you? I'm well, Henry. <laughs> Terrifically well. So I can see. I like the beard. Was it part of your cover? Oh, Lord, no. I only started it a fortnight ago when I knew I was coming back. Not bad for a fortnight, is it? <laughs> it's rather a rum colour. Hmm? Pepper and salt. Oh, well, yes, perhaps it is. I shall shave it off now. I really only grew it to annoy a colonel. <laughs> oh, I, I didn't know they'd given you the MC. Congratulations. Well, I think it rather suits me, don't you? Now then, what's this about my coming to you? Did you fix it? No. I asked for somebody and they offered me you. <laughs> oh, good God, how frightfully funny. <laughs> Look, if you'll get off my desk and sit in a chair, I can sit down. How <clears throat> uh, uh, were foreign parts? Oh, foreign parts were fine. A bit dodgy at times, but only when there were Germans about. Mm. Pain here. Henry, I want a large English gin. Yes? It's a foul, barbaric drink, and I loathe it, but I want a large one today. Major for you? Yes, he's here now. Right away. Who was that? Taking my name in vain. Uh, Commander Lewis, Naval Intelligence. Wants to see us both. We'll pick up that large gin on the way. Well, now, Major Payne, Major Pellew. Does the name Linsky mean anything to you? No. Never heard of it. Garland, then? Uh, Leah, not, Leah Garland. Yes, Leah. That's my girl. Why? You didn't know her real name was Linsky? No. Not a relative of yours? No. But a close friend? I should say so. She's my girl. Look, Commander Lewis, what is all this? Well, I'm sorry to have to tell you that Miss Linsky, Miss Garland, is dead. What did you say? Miss Garland is dead. She went abroad to do a job for us, and it went wrong. Leah... Jason. Oh, Jason, I'm so terribly sorry. How? Shot. If it's any consolation to you, she killed a couple of men in the process. She was doing very fine work for us. How long ago was this? Within the last three weeks. How long has she been with you? About six months. Y you're sure she's dead? Oh, yes. No doubt about that at all, I'm afraid. I didn't know she had good enough languages for that sort of job. Well, she was like a lot of people with that uh, sort of background. She spoke a bit of most things, none of it perfectly. 
But it so happens that where she was working, there were a lot of foreigners and people coming and going who spoke different languages, so that she could get by as belonging to any race they didn't belong to, if you follow me. I take it you mean she was at a port, working among sailors? I'm afraid I can't give you any more details. No, I quite understand. Thank you for telling us so much. Yes. Well, she was a fine girl and did a fine job. God rest her. I was afraid one of you would turn out to be a husband or something. <laughs> it probably didn't happen like that at all. Gestapo probably picks her up and she'd know languages, really, not even decent French. Monsieur l'agent de Gestapo, avez-vous la plume de ma tante? <laughs> That's what she'll have gone around saying. It's just about her form. Monsieur l'agent de Gestapo. <laughs> Monsieur l'agent de Gestapo! <laughs> Lia. Monsieur l'agent de Gestapo. I took him back to the unit the next day. He was rather quiet but otherwise seemed normal, and for a couple of weeks he worked hard. Outside working hours, I was less happy about him. He was either very silent or would talk continuously about absolutely nothing, like a man who cannot bear silence. He rapidly lost interest in the work. But one day, he came to my office and said with a bright smile, Henry, much as it grieves me, I shall soon have to leave you. They can no longer manage without the services of the boy wonder, so there we are. You're going off again? Yes. Foreign parts? That's it. Cooks are fixing it now. Can you tell me anything about it? You needn't think I'm going to give you a lot of stuff to tap out on your little wireless set, Henry. <laughs> All right. Sorry. How do you feel about it? I feel fine about it, Henry. It's just what I need. It'll be very good for me. Hmm. I, I was wondering about that the other day. This must seem a dull place to you, after the other. Not at all. I've enjoyed myself very much. I only wish I could have done more to help. No, oh, you've done a cracking job. Any idea when you're going? In about a week's time, I expect. Hmm. Well, I, I hope it all... <laughs> hey, Jason, steady there. I... I can't. Not now. I can't. You mean you can't go off again? No. I, I can't. I'm, I'm finished. I can't do it again. It's, it's the dropping. I could do the rest, but I, I can't do that again. You, you have to volunteer. Now, look, Jason. I'm quite sure nobody's going to make you do anything you feel you can't. You couldn't jump again. Henry, don't. Let them make me. Don't let them. No, 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 no. Of course not. I'll see them in hell first. I shall refuse to go in a plane. And if they carry me into one, I shall refuse to jump. I'm damned if I will. I'm, I'm damned if I will. I, I can't. I'm, I'm not fit. And that was several weeks ago. What's happened to him since? He's been in and out of hospital. Special forces have no further use for him, and he's on leave sitting at home waiting to be posted back to Airborne. But he says he won't go, that he'll never jump again. So I came to you, Bryce, because I heard you were something important in the Judge Advocates Department. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you can suggest? We can't get away with this nonsense of refusing to obey orders. That way lies a court-martial. Just how bad is he? He just sits around in his dressing gown all day. He's liable to burst into tears and shake. He doesn't sleep. Henry, he never... there's no doubt that the answer to your problem is to hand him over to the tender care of the psychiatrist. You can be sure that if they can possibly find anything wrong with the lad, they will. Their general attitude seems to be that practically everybody in the army is half crazy and ought to be discharged anyway. <laughs> Come to think of it, the little man did behave rather strangely once before. Uh, some... Business with a cat in an air raid. You were there, Henry. Remember? Hmm. Yes. 
Yes, I feel that the, the psychiatrists are the answer. Um, they'll give him all the help he needs. You know, you, you really must excuse me, Henry. I, I have a lot to do. Um, give the little man all my love. Jason took the advice. And just before I went across to France in the wake of the invasion, he was in the hands of the psychiatrists. I cannot be sure exactly when I returned on leave, but I know it was in the depths of winter. I remember, too, that flying bombs were still falling on London. Among the out-of-date letters awaiting me was one inviting me to Mrs. Grayson's at home the following evening at an address in Eaton Square. Jason had taken me to a party of hers at the outbreak of war, and it occurred to me that she might know his whereabouts. Oh, darling, how sweet of you to come. How lovely to see you. Now tell me, which are you? Uh, Henry Pay. Darling, look who's come. Now you can be happy. He kept on badgering me to ask you, and I said, darling, of course I'll ask your Henry. But since we don't know in the least where he is, I don't think there's a chance that he'll ever get the invitation. <laughs> yes, I, I only got back to England yesterday, Mrs. Grayson. Well, what a terrific piece of luck. Well, there you are, darling. There he is. And don't say Kathy doesn't try to make things nice for you. Well, Jason, how are things? Oh, uh, very well, thank you. Uh, uh, I say, come over and talk to Simon. You, you remember Simon? Simon? Good heavens. Yes, of course it is. Simon Green. Why, Henry, darling. <laughs> how much water under how many bridges, my dear? Yeah. Not since there's happy days that were so unmentionably far. <laughs> now, come and sit down between us and tell us all about everything, but everything. Except, of course, about, uh, you know. <laughs> except about what? The unmentionable, my dear, the absurd conflict. You mean the war? Oh, my dear. You're not to know, of course, but that word is never mentioned in this house. We've all had quite enough of it, quite enough. We wait, tense like greyhounds in the leash, for the end of the whole nonsense, and a return to civilised life. Yes. What's happening to you, Jason? Oh, uh, I'm out of the army. For good. Oh, it took a long time, but my discharge came through a fortnight ago. It was my leg, you know. I'd had trouble with it before. They couldn't get it right. They kept on giving him medical boards, and in the end, they invalided me out. With barely a thank you for all that perilous stuff in aeroplanes. Does your leg trouble you now? Uh, not much, really. What are you going to do? I, I don't know. There isn't much one can do. Anyhow, I'm supposed to rest. Excuse me, I want another drink. Oh, you can't think what a relief it was to me when Jason got out of it. He was so brave, so recklessly brave. One was always terrified over what he would do next. Anyhow, I think he's fallen on his feet, you know. Our hostess, my dear, absolutely devoted. Head over heels, and so rich, Henry. I know you don't like to hear the war mentioned, but I think I can hear a bit of it coming. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Oh, yes. It's one of those beastly things. Uh, of course, darling. Uh, Henry, you take a bottle too. Yes, all right. If Aunt Jason doesn't die of right, Henry, he'll be suffocated in the comforting arms of our hostess, don't you think? All right, <laughs> the bomb won't harm you. Oh, the beastly thing. One is so relieved when it goes over and lands on somebody else. <laughs> we all need a good, strong drink. I must go. I'm sure I've overstayed my welcome. Nonsense. I won't hear of it. Have you made him happy? Jason? I don't know. I was glad to see him. He seems to think you do something for him. I... I don't know why. I don't know either. Well, do you do something for him or not? And if so, what? Come on, tell me, George. No, uh, Henry. I don't know. I'm very fond of him. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm very fond of him too, see? Just as long as we know where we stand. If you're one of the things he wants, he shall have you. He shall have any damn thing. Come again soon. Because we're friends, aren't we? Of course. That's all right, then. And you said you wanted to go. All right, you go. You do just what you like, my dear. Jason! 
George is going. A few months later, the war ended. I took up my research work, in London this time, and I found myself, heaven help us, a retired major living in a modest flat off Baker Street. In 1949, I got a lectureship. I'd seen nothing of Jason for some four years. I rang up Cheney Walk several times, but he was never in. And on at least one occasion, the voice that said he was out was remarkably like his own. After that, I gave it up. When we next met, I could see that the cherubic face was beginning to have lines around the eyes. It came as a shock to me to realize that Jason was now 33. Henry, I need a job. I'm sick of messing about. I'd like to be out and be on my own. I was with Kathy for a bit, but I packed that in. That's why I want to get a job. I don't want to go back to Cheney Walk. Why did you pack it in with Kathy? Well... I don't want to say anything against her because she's been very good to me, but she can be so... so possessive. You mustn't have any friends or any life of your own. And of course, she's always been used to having exactly what she wants, and if she doesn't get it, she's livid, so I packed it in. But now I must have a job. Any idea what you want to do? I don't know. There must be something I could do. After all, everybody else gets jobs. Even the dumbest people. What you want is um, something where you could use your languages. Yes. I should like to go abroad. Preferably Italy. I really do speak Italian awfully well. Hmm. I'll have a word with a man I know. Runs the European offices of an American travel agency. That seems a likely answer. Henry Payne speaking. Henry, I've got a job. Selling insurance. I think it might be an awfully good thing for me, don't you? Well, it might. What are they paying you? They don't actually pay me a salary, but I get commission on business I arrange. I'd like to come round and talk to you about it. It really sounds rather fascinating. They gave him a fortnight's training, after which his company turned him loose to sell insurance to an unwarned and unsuspecting world. And I resigned myself to the fact that I should be his first client. For nearly a year, he worked really very hard and did, in fact, write one or two policies for acquaintances. But I don't think he could ever have lived on what he made if it had not been for his small income. I was not surprised when one evening he suddenly said, You know, I think I shall chuck up this job, Henry. Why? Doesn't pay well enough? No. I suppose it'd be all right if you could get enough business, but there are such a hell of a lot of people at it. Well, what will you do then? Look for something else? I suppose so. Though I don't see what. Henry, will you tell me something, frankly? Do you really think anybody will ever pay me enough to live on? I mean, am I worth it? Of course you are. It's only a question of finding the right job. But what job? What is there that I can do that anybody's likely to want? You see, I don't know anything. You know something, everybody else knows something, but I don't. Ever since I left school, it's... It's all been blind alleys. It's very odd to have spent 16 years without learning anything useful. I never really quite see how it's happened. He left in a deep depression. But two days later, arrived with a bottle of champagne and was so excited that at first I thought he'd been celebrating already. It's wonderful news, Henry, and you're the first person to be told I'm going to marry Cathy. Good Come Lord. on, glasses, the cork's about to pop. <laughs> Oh, here they are. Oh. God, what a mess. Good for the carpet, Henry. I'm a ship and you're launching me. Oh. To you both. Oh. When are you going to get married? Hmm? Oh, as soon as we can. Probably next week. We'll just pop into a registry office. You must come. Mm. You must mm. be my best man. 
Or does one have a best man at a registry office? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> have some more champagne. And uh, you'll live in Eaton Square? Well, yes. Well, there's a country place too, of course. Anyhow, we're off to South America first. Have you ever been there? No. Neither have I. Kathy has. In fact, there's practically nowhere that girl hasn't been. <laughs> she says South America's terrific. My God, Henry, I am lucky. <laughs> No more insurance, eh? <laughs> no more bloody insurance. Except that I shall make Cathy take out an enormous policy and draw the commission on it, and then I shall stop. <laughs> I say, Henry, do you think this is all right? I mean, you don't disapprove or anything. Of course not. Only I'm relying on you to tell me, frankly. You're the only person who does tell me, frankly, and I know sometimes I do damn silly things. You don't think this is... Damn silly, because after all, we're not married yet. Oh, come, Jason. You wouldn't not get married just because I didn't approve. Well, uh, I don't know. <laughs> but there's no reason why it shouldn't work, is there? By God, I like the sound of this South American trip, Henry. I've always wanted to go to Chile, particularly. It's such a rum shape. <laughs> I think I must be off. Bless you, Jason. Good luck. But you can't go yet, Henry. You can't. You, you've got to come and see us off. To the airport. You, you must. It's all arranged. Oh, come. You don't need me for that. But you must. You can't leave me to go all by myself. You must. All right. If you really want me to. I hate all these bloody people. Let's have a drink, Henry. You've got one. So I have. Anyhow, I hate them. Well, conspirators as usual. What are you two hatching? He is coming to see us off. Of course he is. Not sure he isn't coming to Paris, too. Would you like that, darling? You'd better go and change. It'll take much longer than I do. And have a lie down first. You need it. You're coming to the airport and no further. See? I didn't even want to come as far as that. Oh, yes. He wanted you and he shall have you. He shall have anything he wants, but only as far as the airport. After that, finish. <laughs> you see, I've done him in the eye, George. Henry. Oh, that's right. Henry Payne. Look here, Cathy. Hadn't you better go and dress? That's quite right. I, I must go and dress. But we're friends, aren't we? Half an hour? But it was ordered for eight and it's ten past now. I know, darling, but they're still fueling or something. Well, tell them we're in a hurry. I have told them they say that's the quickest they can do. Well, if they think I'm going to sit round for half an hour when I'm paying for a special plane, they're very much mistaken. Where is the man? No, 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 you uh, stay there. And you, Henry. You look all in, Jason. Not still suffering from the party. Oh, my God. My leg. I can feel it coming on, the thing I had in the war. Oh, nonsense. You've just drunk too much champagne. No, honestly, Henry. It's going. I can feel it. Well, stand up. <laughs> now, walk about. I... I can't. Yes, you can. <laughs> you told me you could always make it work if you tried hard enough. Now, come on now, Jason. Give me your arm. This is where we came in. <laughs> and this time you haven't got to jump out of the bloody thing. You've only got to sit in it with Cathy as far as Paris, and then tomorrow you'll be off to South America, you lucky so-and-so. Uh, Genoa first. Yes, Genoa first. Oh, <laughs> you'll be able to talk Genoese. Yes. <laughs> I can talk Genoese rather well. At least I could. I expect I've forgotten it now. <laughs> All right now? If, uh, if I let go of your arm? Yes. Yes, it's going to go off, I think. You know, you're the only person who's ever been able to get rid of it for me. All done by kindness? Yes. I say, Henry, do you think it can have been Genoa? It was a port. They told us it was a port, didn't they? Hmm? Oh, you mean Lear? Yes. 
She was working at a port. Only, don't you see, if it was Genoa, I might quite easily have met her, because I was there quite a bit. I might have met her, Henry. That would have been damn funny, hmm? <laughs> Scusi, signora Gento de Gestapo. <laughs> Dry up, Jason. Here comes Cathy. Hey, Robert, ten minutes. How's Henry said something funny? I didn't know he ever said funny things. Perhaps we should keep him as a court jester. But not just now. Goodbye, Henry. They were back from their honeymoon a month early. And Jason invited me to dine with them two or three times. But each time he put me off with the excuse that Cathy was under the weather or too busy. After that, there was silence. Until one evening, nearly a year later, he turned up at my flat. Hello, Jason. Come on in. Make yourself at home. Well, how's everything? How's Cathy? I don't know how Cathy is, and I don't bloody well care. All I know is she's gone. Gone? Where? God knows. She shut up the townhouse and shut up the country house and pushed off. So I've left her. For good? I wouldn't live with her again if she was the only woman on earth. I'd rather be dead. You won't believe some of the things she's done to me. Nobody would believe it. Here, have a drink. It's, uh, it's a rather special malt. I think you'll like it. Uh, thanks. It's so extraordinary. At first, she couldn't do enough for me, Henry. Kept on giving me things, a car, monthly allowance, manservant. I tried to refuse, to cut down, but she wouldn't hear of it. It became embarrassing. Then, I, I don't know, she made me buy things and then refused to pay for them. For no reason at all, just like that. Whenever the mood took her. Told me in front of her friends that she could take it all away. And that bloody lot, all sneering at me and... And she was unfaithful. Made no attempt to hide it. I'm extremely sorry, Jason. But, quite frankly, I'm not surprised. But why did she do it to me, Henry? Why did she ever marry me? She kept on saying she loved me and that money didn't matter and that it was silly not to marry her just because she was rich. She kept on saying... She loved me even after we were married. That's why I stuck it for so long, because I thought she did in a queer way. But of course, she... She can't ever have done... I realise that. Oh, I think she did love you in a way. But she just isn't a person that can go on doing it. You, you, you really think it might have been that? Uh, I, I, I wouldn't mind so much if it was. Otherwise, I should feel that that I didn't understand people at all. Well, what happens now? Can you go back to your godmother's in Cheney Walk? Yeah, not very well. You see, the old lady doesn't know about Cathy. You mean you never told her you were married? No. I didn't think she'd like it. Then what on earth does she think you're doing? I can't remember... But it'll come back to me. I've still got my own 300, of course. The problem is where to live. Well, I've got a spare bed you could have for a bit. That's very kind of you, Henry. Uh, just for a few days until I can get things sorted out. All I want is a bed, really. Jason was very little trouble to have in the flat. For perhaps a month, he seemed well and reasonably happy. But then he began to suffer from insomnia. And after that, I began to recognize the old symptoms all too clearly. Look here, Jason. You've got to pull yourself together. You can't just lie in your bed all day moping. That's no good. I'll go if I'm in the way, Henry. 
it's not a question of being in the way, but it isn't good for you. Well, beat me then. Beat me, the lot of you. That's the only thing that's ever been good for me, isn't it? Jason, Jason, <laughs> stop it. I don't know what to do. I'll do anything you tell me, but I don't know what to do. Tell me what to do. Look, Jason, you'll never get anywhere until you're properly fit and getting proper sleep and so on. Yes, yes I'm not very fit. Uh, I haven't told you, but I'm having trouble with my leg. You know, the thing they invalided me out for. I think you ought to go and see a doctor I know. His name's Parsons. He's just round the corner. Not if he's a trick cyclist. I tell you, I had half a dozen of them during the war. They never did me any good. Well, Jason, you asked me what to do, and I'm telling you what to do. Go and see Parsons as a favour to me, just to put my mind at rest. Well, of course, Henry. I mean, it's nonsense to say it's a favour to you, isn't it? After all, it's entirely for my own good. Of course I'll go, if you think so. Your friend Pellew is very immature emotionally and very insecure, Henry. I did warn you about that, Parsons. He's always been like that. Uh, he spins yarns and tells lies, and if people believe them, it gives him a feeling of power. Uh. But when he comes up against something tough, as he did in the war or in his marriage, he'll crack up. Finding he can't handle the world, he'll withdraw further and further from it into fantasies until he doesn't know what's real and what isn't. And the end of that, schizophrenia. Well, what do you think we'd better do? Oh. In the short term, anything you can do to get him out of his shell. Job, friends, girls. Any damn thing except being alone and doing nothing. His trouble is that he feels nobody loves him or ever has. He's fond of you, but you're all mixed up with his father, which doesn't help. Apart from that, he doesn't seem to have had a normally satisfactory emotional relationship with anybody in the world, man or woman. Look, he has told you about Leah, has he? Leah? No. Never mentioned the name. I walked the short distance back to the flat. Jason was out. I was tired and would have liked to have gone to bed, but I thought I should wait until he returned. Parsons had depressed me. I had a feeling he was throwing the whole thing back at me instead of providing a solution. I was fond of Jason, but I did not fancy having him on my hands indefinitely. And as for finding him a job or friends, that was easier said than done. I must have been sitting there for a quarter of an hour before I saw the letter. I think I knew what it was as soon as I saw it. Dear Henry, Parsons is a nice man, but I do not think a trick cyclist is really what I need. He keeps telling me to relax and not worry about things, and so I find myself tending not to care about things, instead of pulling myself together and putting them right. Which is not good for me and unfair to you, because I just can't go on living on you. I have therefore gone away and shall not come back until I've got everything right which I think I must do by myself, because I never have, which has been half the trouble. I'm sorry not to have seen you to say goodbye and thank you. I realize I have never paid you anything for food, but as soon as I have my next quarter's money, I will send you a check. I think this will be very good for me, as I always do better if I have to discipline myself. Again, thank you. And you were not to know that this is what I needed, like that time at school. I hope to see you again soon. Yours, Jason. Jason Pellew. In your statement, you have expressed regret. And what little there is to be said in your favor has been ably urged. But the fact remains that nothing the court has heard amounts to a full explanation of this disgraceful behavior, let alone an excuse for it. Your record shows that you are not a stupid man nor one likely to have difficulty in knowing right from wrong. The choice was yours, and you chose to minister to your own petty desires and comforts by robbing others. 
Society must and shall be protected against this type of monstrous egoism. I take into account your previous good character, your service to your country in time of war, and the fact that once arrested, you made a frank admission of your crimes. But for the crimes themselves, I can find no excuse. In these circumstances, the least sentence that I can pass, consistent with my duty, is that you should go to prison for 12 months. Fair enough, I suppose, Henry, according to their lights. Well, he might get 18 months. He wasn't exactly defended with genius. Not that, that it would have made much difference. It was pretty hopeless from the start. Yes. Right from the start. The Fall of the Sparrow was adapted for radio by Anthony Keary from the novel by Nigel Balchin. Henry Payne was played by Ian Thompson and Jason Pellew by Brian Hewlett. Bryce, William Edel, Leah Garland, Maureen Lipman, Catherine Grayson, Shirley Dixon. Mrs. Pellew, Hilda Schroeder, General Pellew and Commander Lewis, Hayden Jones, Mrs. Payne, Catherine Parr, Mr. Payne and the fascist orator, Martin Friend. The judge, William Fox, the prosecuting counsel and Dr. Parsons, Nigel Graham, the defending counsel and Giles, Sam Dastor, Laidlaw and Farthing, Terry Scully, and Simon Greaves, Fraser Carr. Henry and Jason, as children, were played by Eve Rain and Judy Bennett. The production was by Harry Catlin. Next week, Saturday Night Theatre presents the romantic story of The Prisoner of Zender, adapted for radio by Eric Mashwitz and Kay Patrick, from the novel by Anthony Hope, with original music by Robert Chignall and Leslie Woodgate. <laughs>